come on in. Feel free to ask me questions if you have any. We've got like a whole minute left before class starts. But like I said, you can ask me questions now if you want. How's it going, Andrew, Miguel, Corey? I'm doing all right. That's cool. Uh, have another student coming in. All right, well, it's about time to go ahead and start. Uh, please, those of you who haven't already done so, go ahead and type your first and last name into the uh, chat so that we'll have it for your role. And feel free, does anybody have any questions? If you do, go ahead and voice them now. Otherwise, I'm going to get started. If you can't, if you don't have a speaker, you're welcome to chat me your question, but... Mm. This is the beginning of the Q&A portion of the class. <laughs> remember you folks have a test that's due this week uh you yeah, had till sunday to do it you're supposed to go to proctor all that good stuff are you going to be in person um or like having an in-person class tomorrow i am uh yes i have a class at 9 30 in the morning uh, there's a test, and uh, then I'll be gone after that. But I, I, if you're if you need me or something, I, I have a little bit of time after that class is over. It runs from nine thirty to ten fifty, uh, and I have an appointment at two. But other than that, I, I can uh, wait around if somebody needs something. Okay. All right. All right, so it looks like no one has any other questions. What I want to do is go ahead and get you started on uh, some more stuff from the Law of Gravity, Chapter 6. Uh, so you should be able to continue doing Chapter 6 homework. I'm definitely going to make it due this Sunday. So uh, make sure you have your conceptual homework as, regular, as well as your regular homework uh, done by then. I'm looking at, I'm checking my assignments right now to see if I've already fixed the due dates. I thought I had, but let me check just to make sure. So I'm looking at chapter six and in chapter six is due the 22nd. I do believe, I do believe that's actually this coming uh, Sunday. Let's double check. And some chapters are going to be due before that because of the weirdness thing. So don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Uh, no, I actually made the 22nd where it's due on Tuesday. I'm okay with that, though. I'm going to leave both of them as being due on Tuesday, even though we, we should start into Chapter 7 by then. So 1022 is when they're done. I would definitely recommend you get it done by uh, Sunday, really. But either way, we're going to go on. So uh, when we spoke last time, I had actually given you Newton's law of gravity. And what we found was Newton's law of gravity was uh, F is equal to the gravitational constant G. Let me go ahead and share my screen with you guys, too. Uh, almost forgot for a second there. That wouldn't have been helpful. <laughs> So the screen should be coming up any minute now. Oh, that's not what I was going for. So it should be coming up any minute. 
So the force of gravity is equal to some constant g, uh, which is the gravitational constant of the universe, times the product of the masses, m1 and m2, divided by the square of the distance between 1 and 2. So uh, this is a vector quantity. Forces are vector or vectors. Uh, it not only matters how big the force is, but in what direction. In fact, later, yeah. Yeah. later we'll learn there's another thing called torque that's a little different than force, and we have to treat that a little differently. But that one uh, not only depends on uh, the magnitude and the direction of force, but also the location at which it's applied, which the uh, all forces in general do, but they introduce a potential to rotate as you do uh, specific spots other than the mass where you apply the force. But what I thought I'd do is uh, your book takes time to make a, a vector version of uh, Newton's law of gravity. I'm going to do the same thing, uh, partly to get you prepared for the next semester, but partly so you'll have some kind of tool for that. So to do it, what I'm going to do is open up a, uh, I'm going to draw a coordinate system. And it's a somewhat arbitrary coordinate system. And I'm just trying to use this to get a sense of what exactly the force of gravity is and which points, uh, which way does it actually point. So what we can imagine is a either a point particle or a spherical mass right here. Uh, that really is not too good. So either a point particle or a spherical mass right here. And if it's not a point particle, then if it's spherically distributed, it's going to behave just like it's located at its center. So what I would like to do is create a vector that points from the origin of this arbitrary coordinate system to the center of mass of that point particle or that uh, mass. So this mass right here is going to be what I call M1. Whoa, I'm going to have to put that somewhere else. I'm going to say that is M1 right here. And now I'm going to draw the vector that points from the origin. Uh, I did not mean to draw it in that color. I was drawing it in purple. That was my plan. And that actually points to the center of mass of M1. And we'll call that vector R1. We could call it R sub M1, but that's just packing up stuff. Now I'm going to do another math. Call it M2, and let's say its location is right here, okay? So that one's going to be M2, and we need another vector that points to it, okay? Again, if that was a point particle, we just point to the point particle because it literally is at a point. But if it's a spherical distribution of mass, then the we should be pointing to the center of mass. So I'll say arrows are from the origin origin to the center of mass. of one of the masses. So that's kind of nice, and I can get that. Now, remember, the force of gravity is always attractive. So if I wanted to, for instance, write the force F12, which means the force acting on M1 due to M2. So notice that wording. That's very important. The 1, 2 means it's the force on 1 due to 2. So uh, I've told you that Newton gave us... Mm. 
I don't know what's going on. Uh, Newton gave us a prescription for finding out the direction of this force. He specifically said if it's two point particles, uh, the force will act along the line connecting those two uh, point particles or in the event of a spherical distribution of mass or any distribution of mass that for in general, uh, if you take the uh, line that connects the center of mass of M1 to the line uh, to the center of mass of M2, that line right there is parallel to the force. Okay. Now gravity only has an attract attractive force. So M1 is going to be attracted to M2 and M2 is going to be attracted to M1. But right now I'm getting ready to try to calculate F12. So that's the force on one due to two. So I'll write it like this, F12. Now, uh, can anybody tell me, since I told you it's actually along the line connecting the center of masses, so it's along that line right there, can you tell me which way that force should actually act on M1 based on that line? There's two directions for that dashed black line. Uh, you just got to choose one of them. So anybody tell me which direction the force is? Negative. Uh, it, it will, will ultimately do make it negative, but, uh, I don't think that's what, what I was, well, that wasn't what I was trying to ask, but do you think it points from the M1 towards the M2 or from the M2 towards the M1? It was not a well-versed question, so clearly. I think it points towards M1. Okay. So you think the force on M1 points towards M1? Okay. No, I think. Go the ahead. force on two points towards one. Oh, gotcha. The force uh, due to two <laughs> points towards one. Is that that's your second answer? The answer you're trying to tell me now? That is the answer. Gotcha. That I my final answer. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're gonna win. You're gonna be a millionaire now. So <laughs> now, in reality, what it is is it has to be an attractive force. So what we mean by that is the force on M one must be pushing it towards. M2. So if I drew that as a separate vector, this red guy right here, uh, I think you can figure out now that you know about vectors and what they look like when you add two vectors. For instance, if you add the vector R1 and the vector R2, which I never actually wrote down there, but you now see it. So uh, if you add those two vectors, would that give you a vector that looks like that red one? Remember, these two vectors, R1 and R2, are tail to tail. And uh, you need to recall, how do you add vectors when they're tail to tail? Anybody remember what we do? When you add vectors that are tail to tail, you have to complete the parallelogram. And then the sum vector, the resultant vector, is uh, the vector pointing from the common origin of the tails, so from the origin in this case, uh, to the diametrically opposed opposite vertex. So if I were to, for instance, go ahead and complete this parallelogram, what I try to do is take and make a exact copy of R1. Now R1 went over about two and a little bit over a half to the right, but it also went up one, two, three, four, five, six and a quarter. So I'm going to say one, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six and a quarter. So I'm going to say right about there. And then I got to go over uh, two and we'll roast past a, ha a half. So that's going to be over here, over here. So this would be my copy of R1. Uh, and this would be my copy of R2. So R1 and plus R2 would actually be, I'm going to use a green arrow uh, just because it's something that we don't need. So this vector right here is R1 plus R2. So you see that one doesn't help us. So clearly, 
R1 plus R2 is not helpful for the direction of F12. Okay, so uh, you, you've got to come up with a vector and the operations that we know of so far, and some of this I'm, hin I'm hinging it on the fact that you've had something equivalent to trigonometry. So uh, the only th things you can really do with these vectors is you could multiply them by a scalar, uh, you could add them, you could subtract them, you could take a dot product, but a dot product is also called a scalar product. So that would just produce a scalar, not a vector. So we can throw the dot product away. And then the last thing we could do is take a cross product. And that is also called the vector product. And that creates a vector as well. So that one's usable. So it looks like all we can do is multiply a, a vector times a scalar. Uh, we can add two vectors. We can subtract two vectors and we can take a cross product of the two vectors. If you know about the cross product, like R1 cross R2, what you use when doing that is your middle, your right hand and your index finger should go parallel to the first vector. Like if I'm doing R1 cross R2, my index finger should be exactly parallel to R1. And then this finger, which if it's a perfect scenario where we're doing a cross product between two vectors that are at 90 degrees, then this works perfectly. But they're normally going to be at some angle less than 90 degrees, so that middle finger can move a little bit. So in this case, uh, R2 is actually pointing up and to the right, but at a le less steep angle. So uh, what I'm going to do is point my finger as if it's uh, like an axle that can rotate about itself, right? And that particular vector is actually parallel to R1. I need to keep rotating my hand until I can point my middle finger in the same direction as R2. Once I've done that, which is what I'm holding it right now at, uh, then my thumb points in the direction of R1 cross R2. So in this case, you'd basically find that R1 uh, cross R2 would point into the page. So we can eliminate that now. Uh, so I'll write this also R1 cross R2 points into the page. not useful. Okay. So all we've got left now is addition and subtraction, but we already showed you that the addition of those two vectors gives us the addition of two vectors gives us that green vector that's not even remotely related. So all we can do is say subtraction. Now, should it be R1 minus R2 or R2 minus R1? Which one of those gives us that red vector? Okay. Pretty sure it's... Go ahead. Subtraction, right? Yeah, it is subtraction, but is it R2 minus R1 or is it R1 minus R2? It's, God damn it, R2 minus R1. Exactly. Okay. Here, here's the reason why. Remember vector subtraction. I'm going to write this down as like a general fact. Vector subtraction. A minus B is defined to be the A vector added to the opposite of the B vector. And of course, the opposite of the B vector means just put the head at the opposite end. So for instance, if I did R2 minus R1, that would be the same thing as R2 plus the negative of R1. And the negative of R1, if you come over here, you'd see that it would just be the same as R1, except now it points the opposite direction. 
and this red is negative R1. So now what you see after, since I've drawn that other vector, the red vector, since you've seen that drawn and know where it is, I think you can now tell that when you add R2 and negative R1, do you see that you do get the vector from the tip of R1 to the M2? Because now notice after I flip the head to make negative R1, those two vectors, negative R1 and R2, are now uh, head to tail. So when you have two vectors that are head to tail, you draw a vector from the tail to the head of the last one, from the tail of the first to the head of the last. That's exactly what that red vector is that I was asking you how to get it. So that vector is actually going to be R2 minus R1, which I'm going to define as R21. So when you're talking about a, a vector like R and you subscript it to 1, then that normally means that it's R2 minus R1. And that's the way I'm doing it in my class anyways. Okay. So you're absolutely right. You could write G times M1 times M2 over, and here's where I'm going to write the magnitude of R21 like that. And of course, R21, notice is literally the length of that vector is literally the distance between them. And that's exactly what the R is supposed to be in Newton's law of gravity. So it's okay to put it down there, but I have to then square it because Newton's law says that it's, it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Now I need to make it into a vector. So I could multiply it by R21, which is R2 minus R1. If I do that, though, remember R2 minus that R1 has a magnitude equal to what we called R12 or what we also call R21. It wouldn't matter if you did it backwards or forward. The magnitudes would be the same. So if I go and multiply this force equation by the, magnet, by the vector R2 minus R1, then it's going to be off by a, an extra factor of R12. So to correct for that, what we do is we, well, there's a couple ways we can do it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand on this and realize that I can erase this two now. Now that it's erased, I'm going to replace it with three because I'm going to put another R21 up there. And when I do that, that's going to introduce a power of R12 slash R21. So putting in a third compensates for that, and I just write R21. But of course, with that, I'd say such that, that's a mathematical symbol that we use sometimes. It looks like a cursive lowercase s with part of it missing, and then a cursive lowercase t. So it's such that. But such that R21 is defined to be R2 minus R1. So this is only for position R displacement vectors. In other words, the terminology where I use one, two meant something entirely different when I said uh, the force sub one, two, right? F sub one, two means the force on one due to two. But if you have an X or a Y or an R vector, when you have one, two, that, that should mean to you that it's vector two minus vector one if it's two, one. If it's one, two, it should be vector one minus vector two, right? Now, the problem with this R21 is that it's not easy to remember. Notice the R21s in the exact opposite order of the... Uh, suffixes, or excuse me, of the uh, subscripts on F. So I would say it would be better to write this again as F12 is equal to the negative of G M1 M2 over R12 cubed times R one, two. 
such that R1, 2 is defined to be R1 minus R2. Notice that's the opposite direction that we had decided upon that Andrew had picked out, for instance. But that's okay because I corrected it by putting a negative in front of it. So just to keep those prefixes, uh, those, excuse me, those subscripts in the same order, all we had to do is slip a negative in. So that's a really good answer. And I'm going to give you another version as well. Uh, do you all know how to make a unit vector? Like if you get a vector, do you know how to then convert it to a unit vector? Anybody know the trick on that? It's something you might have gotten in, in calc, but you might not have, or excuse me, in free calculus or trig, part of free calculus. Uh, anybody know? All right. So the way you make a unit vector is, uh, and th this is an ideal thing, right? If you want to express a vector that points in a very specific direction, that's easy to do. You can just take the uh, Y coordinate and the X coordinate for the endpoint of the vector, and then the X co comma Y point for the uh, for the non-headed end for the tail end of the vector, and you do X of the head minus X of the tail. And that'll give you your X component of the vector. And if you do Y, Y2 minus Y1, that would give you the Y component or uh, the Y component of the head minus the Y component of the tail. Uh, that would give you the vector Y component for it. Does that make sense? So once you have that vector, now you have a vector that has a, a you know, I hat, J hat, and K hat. Uh, term. In other words, I just did X and Y, but I could have did it in three dimensions as well. All you had to do was subtract the final points, which are the points is where the arrowhead is, minus the initial points, which is the point where the arrow tail is. And just instead of treating those as numbers that came out of the ordered triples or the ordered pairs, you're going to pretend like that subtraction gave you a vector component, and you'll put the X head minus X tail next to I hat in parentheses, of course. The both of them in parentheses. So uh, R head, my, or excuse me, X head minus X tail in parentheses times I hat. Then Y head minus Y tail in parentheses times J hat. Then Z head minus Z tail times K hat. Okay. So now that you have that vector, all you really have to do to make it a unit vector is you calculate the actual magnitude of that vector. Let's say it came out to be 7.8. Now, if you took and divided each of those components of the vector by 7.8, which is the magnitude of the vector, then the vector would automatically have a unit uh, uh, length. And not only that, if the vector had a length of 7.98 uh, newtons, then you're going to divide by 7.98 newtons. So the newtons cancel out and you get a pure unit vector, meaning a vector that's one unit long. And that unit is just a counting unit, not, not one meter, not one centimeter, not one newton, not one newton per coulomb. Okay. So that's how you make a unit vector is you just take the vector and divide it by its magnitude. So if you look at this vector again, you can see this vector formula you can see uh, that another way we could possibly do it is pretty straightforward. Let me erase this real quick. Uh, we could use a unit vector, in which case I would say this also gives us uh, – actually, I'll do that on the other line. I erased all that so I could do it on this line, but now I don't want to. Okay. So that's that. So alternatively, alternatively, we could say F12 is equal to negative G M1 M2 over R12. Now I'm going to put it back squared. And I'm going to write R12 with a hat over it. That means a unit vector, which really is defined to be negative G 
M1, M2 over R12 squared. Now, uh, what we're going to have is the vector R12, which is R1 minus R2. And then we're going to divide that by R12. And you can see when I write it that way, uh, explicitly showing you what R12 is, you can see that that R12 in the bottom makes the bottom now cubed again, like I had in the previous box. So you, hopefully now you see why it's cubed in the bottom. Does everybody get that? So this whole quantity right here, this quantity is actually R12 hat. Okay, so I can write it that way, or I can ultimately also write it this way, negative G M1 M2 over R12 squared R12 unit vector F12, which is exactly the same thing I wrote up there, but the main thing is I wrote it again with the regular R12 without showing everything so explicitly. So that really is the vector form of Newton's law of gravity. So if you can, if you want to solve a vectorial problem from Newton's law of gravity, all you have to do is create a vector that points to M1, create a vector that points to M2, and then subtract R2 from R1. And then if you wanted to, you can make it a unit vector by dividing it by its magnitude, or you could just leave it like that and up the denominator from R12 squared to R12 cubed. Either one of those works. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay. So what I want to do, for instance, is let's do an example where we actually calculate the force on, on, let's say, like the moon or something like that. So if we had, for instance, the moon in a particular point in space, then the moon is pulling, uh, the sun is pulling on the moon, and it's also pulling on the earth. And all we have to do is try to figure out, well, what's the total for force on the moon? Because not only is the sun force acting on the moon, but so is the Earth's gravitational force acting on the moon. I thought I had a problem in here that your book had already done uh, that I've used, but I must be in the wrong section. I think I'll check back in section uh, 6.1 now. I thought it was in 6.2, but it's not seeing it there. So hopefully I'll see it in a second. Yeah, that's not it. Let's do one more. So, you know, using this formula seems really, really complicated. Uh, but I want to show you, it looks really, really complicated, but it's not really complicated. So as soon as I find this other example, ah, there it is. So I'm looking at what your book called example 6-3. So let's look at that. What's up me either? So what we're going to have here is the sun, which I will say is this bright, bright yellow. Okay, that bright, bright yellow was a really poor choice. <laughs> I'm going to choose this crappy orangey baby poop brown color. Okay, so this is going to be our sun. Whoa, nearly. Okay, now some distance away is going to be our Earth-Moon system. So we might, for instance, argue that, uh, yeah, I'm going to do it differently than the way the book did. I'm going to say this right here is the Earth. 
okay? And then this right up here, which I'll make sort of a grayish color, this over here is the moon. Okay, now if we measured the distance from the center of the moon to the center of the earth, we get a distance of approximately one AU, one astronomical unit, and I was trying to look for the astronomical unit. Uh, I'll just write it as 1 AU, and we'll work that out in a second. I think it's 1.59 times 10 to the 11th. Uh, we can Google that to make sure. But that's that distance. And then the distance from the center of the Earth to the center of the moon, that distance, using my blue again, that distance is 60 times the radius of the earth and the radius of the earth is 6.378 times 10 to the sixth meters so if i multiply that by number by 60 i'm going to say 6.378 whoa nearly 6.378 times 10 to the six and times 60, that's going to give me 3.826.8268, one extra sig fig, times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, times 10 to the 8th meters. Notice that's a little bit bigger than... Uh, what the distance light can travel in one second. Remember, light is about three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. This is a little bit bigger than three times 10 to the eighth uh, meters. So it could, uh, it takes about one and a quarter seconds roughly for light to come from the moon to us. Now we have that, and what we want to calculate is what is the total force oops on the moon that's the question we're asking okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to fix up yet another coordinate system just so we can all agree which direction is the x direction which direction is the y direction that sort of thing and I'm going to call this our x-axis. And I'm going to call this our y-axis. And notice the sun's position is at the origin. I'm going to Google 1AU real quick. Just uh, And actually, it's in our table, too. I just don't have a book with me. Uh, AU in meters is what I just Googled. And it is giving me, oh, it's a cubic meter, what a dummy. 1.496 times 10 to the 11th. That seems like what I remembered. So uh, 1 AU equals 1.496 times 10 to the 11th. Whoa, no times 10 to the 11th meters, okay? So uh, we have that the force acting on the moon should be parallel to that. And the force acting on the earth should be parallel, or excuse me, I shouldn't do that. The force acting on the moon from the earth is along that line. So you would have to go through and calculate a magnitude like we normally do using the formula uh, 
of Newton's law of gravity, and that's fine, but I'm going to show you how to do it with this specific, specific formula that we just derived. So uh, I need some more information. I'm going to need the mass of the sun. Excuse me. The mass of the sun. So I'm going to say M sun is 2 point. It's actually 1.99. 1 1.99 times 10 to the 30th uh, kilograms. And I need the mass of the uh, earth, which is 5.98, yeah, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Okay. And we also need the mass of the moon, which I'll write as mass sub M. And the mass of the moon is, in fact, 7.35. times 10 to the 22nd kilograms. So now we have everything we want. So first off, I'm going to calculate the force. Well, let me first off write solutions so we can show what equations I'm making use of. So solution. I'm going to make use of the fact that F12 is equal to negative G M1, M2 over R12 cubed times R12, okay? And R12 is equal to R1 minus R2, okay? So if I want to calculate the force on the moon due to the sun, then that's going to be negative... 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons meter squared per kilogram squared. That's the G. Now I need the mass of the sun, which is 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms times the mass of the moon, which is 7.35 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms, and then all of that is going to be divided by R12, uh, but I need to compute what R1 and what R2 is. So in this case, it's going to be RMRS. So RMS is equal to RM minus RS. RM for the moon in other words, or excuse me, yeah, RM for the moon is actually a little more complicated. It's going to be, and this is where we can use points. Like, remember, this is our x-axis, so that y has an x-axis that's exactly the same, uh, or excuse me, has an x-coordinate that's exactly the same of the Earth, and uh, it has a y-coordinate that is exactly equal to the distance between the Earth and the Moon, which is the 3.8268 times to the eighth meters. So the the radius, the R sub M, is the vector that points from the origin to the Moon. So what I'm going to say is R M is uh, 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters i hat plus now i've got to take the distance for the y component that's going to be 3.8268 times 10 to the 8th meters and that points in the j hat direction so that's rm now, I also need our sun, but that one's really easy. Our sun is just zero vector. Okay. So when I do RM minus RS, then really all I get is RM. And of course, the magnitude of that, magnitude of RMS is equal to the square root of 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters squared plus 
0.2268 times 10 to the eighth meters squared, which is quite a bit smaller. So this number is going to look a lot like 1.496. So let's see exactly how much. 1.496 times 10 to the 11th squared. And now that's uh, 2.238 times 10 to the 22nd. And now I'm going to add to that uh, 3.8268, 3.8268 times 10 to the 8th. And I'm going to square that one. So this number right here, I'm going to use blue, turns out to be 2.2380 times 10 to the 22nd meter squared. And this number turns out to be 1.4644. Yeah, 44 four is right. Times 10 to the 17th meters squared. And now I'm going to take the square root of the, that sum. So I do the square root of my last answer. And that gives me essentially, well, that's actually a little bit bigger than I expected. That gave me 2.2, two, no, that can't be right. Okay, yeah, I screwed up something, but the first thing I did should be right. Uh, I want to say, I want to do this calculation again because I just made some arithmetic error. So I'm going to take 2.238 times 10 to the 22nd plus 1.4644. No, I can't do that either. Crap, crap, square. No. I did square it already, 1.46, uh, 4, 4 times 10 to the 17th. Okay. So when I add those two, I get 2.238 times 10 to the 22nd. And when I take the square root of that, that gives me a little bit better number, 1.496. Glad I caught that instead of making that careless mistake and then having to go back and correct it all for you. So it turns out to be very much like I said, which was very close to uh, the 496. I'm going to say the answer is 1.4960. So literally, it's just a, essentially the same number I had before times 10 to the 11th meters. So that's the magnitude. And that means this number down here under the two masses is that number. And that number, of course, has to be cubed. And then I just multiply it by 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters I hat plus 3.8268 times 10 to the 8th meters J hat. Okay, so I actually have a vector quantity. This, this part right here was just a sidebar calculation, so I'm going to circle it off to keep the confusion to a minimum. Now I'm going to say F, M, S is equal to, now I'm going to do all the math. What I'm going to get is uh, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times 1.99 times 10 to the 30th times 7.35 
times 10 to the 22nd. And then all that's got to be divided by 1.496 times 10 to the 11th squared, or actually cubed. And this gives me an answer of negative 2.9139 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 times 10 to the 9th. That ultimately gives me Newtons per Coulomb meter. like that. And then, of course, that's times 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters I hat plus parentheses 3.8268 times 10 to the 8th meters J hat like that. So now all I have to do is distribute those numbers and I'll actually have the vector. So I'm going to take this 29138 and I'm going to multiply that by 1.496 times 10 to the 11th. And that's going to give me 4.3592 times 10 to the 20th. And this should be completely... Uh, Actually, that one shouldn't have been Newtons per Coulomb meter. It should have been Newtons per meter. So this will just be Newtons. Let me fix that. That was, I was remembering the electric field unit. So that C should not have been down there. Okay. Now this is the X component of the vector. And it's, of course, negative because I had to multiply all that junk by the negative number. And then I got to multiply it by I hat. And then I have the other one, which is 2.91. 8, 8 times 10 to the ninth times 10 to the ninth. I got to multiply that by the 3.826. So times 3.8268 times 10 to the eighth meters. And that gives me my minus 1.11. Five one times ten to the eighteenth newtons j hat. So that's one vector we already figured out, and it was just blind, blindly applying the formula. The, the hardest part is the arithmetic, right? But you see how easy that went. Now we can do the force on the moon due to the Earth. The overall principle that we're learning here is one I already told you about earlier, and that's the, that the force caught on the moon, the total force on the moon, is the sum of all the forces acting on it. So right now we're pretending the only forces acting on it are just the sun and the earth. So that's sufficient for what we're doing. Now I need to calculate the formula for or the equation or the force vector for the force on the moon as a result of the earth. So I'm going to take a negative 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. I'm going to leave off the units. We worked out those units pretty good, so we sort of know what's happening. Now I've got to take the mass of the uh, moon uh, and the mass of the earth. The mass of the earth is 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. The mass of the moon is 7.35 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. And yes, I said I was leaving off the units. And then, yes, I summarily forgot to leave off the units. Uh, now, what is the distance between the moon and the Earth? That's a much smaller distance. So we're going to take that and just say this one is uh, 3.8. 
times 10 to the eighth meters. And that's got to be cubed. And of course, we need the vector R sub ME. And that's the vector to the moon minus the vector to the earth. Now, the vector to the earth is easy peasy, and the vector to the moon we've already worked out. So we can say times Rm minus Re. I've got to figure out what Rm is. We actually already know it. But Rm, we know, is specifically 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters times I hat plus uh, 3.8268 times 10 to the 8th meters in the J hat direction. So that's RM. Now RE is going to be just in this case, notice it only is in the x direction. So I'm just going to put the distance, which is uh, 1 AU. So that should be 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters. And all of that should be purely in the I hat direction. So I can write RM minus RE is equal to... Uh, I only have an X component, but you can see that the 1.496 I hat from the RM, uh, the 1.496 times 10 to the 11th, is going to subtract from it RE, the 1.496 times 10 to the 11th uh, meters in the I hat direction. So that should just give us exactly zero in the I hat direction. And then I have to add the two Y components to uh, get the new Y component. So the Y component for the uh, for the actual moon, that distance is just uh, the 3.826 times 10 to the 8th meters in the J hat direction. Now I have to subtract that from it. We've already done the Y component, so now all I have is uh, Rm minus zero. So there's no J component for the Re. I'm just going to write down exactly 3.8268 times 10 to the eighth meters. And uh, that's all in the J hat direction. Okay. So we now have all these quantities. I'm going to copy them over to the next page so I can make use of it and finish this with a little bit more paper left. So I'm copying that. I did not mean to move that, but that's good enough. Now I'm going to paste here. So that's what I've got so far. So now I can finally write that the force the force FME is equal to, I had already computed basically the number, I just hadn't computed RM minus RE. So I'm going to take the negative 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 24 times 7.35 times 10 to the 22, and that looks right. Now I've got to divide that by 3.8268 times 10 to the eighth, and that's going to be cubed. Oh crap, it said I had a syntax error. I'm not seeing an easy way to fix it. That's not cool. I know there's an exit button on here somewhere. Oh, there it is.
That was, that's what I did. I got to do it again. 6.67 times 10 to negative 11 times 5.98. Five point nine eight times ten to the twenty four times seven point three five times ten to the eighth divided by three point eight two six times ten to the eighth, and that's going to be cubed. Ooh. Well, I mean, I'm checking. I got a number that was really, really small. So I'm concerned that maybe I didn't do it right. I do see 6.67, 10 to the negative 11th. That's right. 5.98, 10 to the 24th. 7.35 times 10 to the 22. Ah, that's what happened. Times 10 to the 7.35 times 10 to the 22. Evidently, I'd left off that 22. And then I'm going to do divide by 3.826 times 10 to the 8. And that's cubed. And I'm going to say enter. Ah, much better. So now I've got negative 5.2346 times 10 to the 11th newtons per meter. And all that's going to be multiplied by just zero point, or excuse me, just three point eight two six eight times ten to the eighth meters, pointing in the j hat direction. So I'm going to say times three point eight two six eight times ten to the eighth. And that gives me 2.0032 times 10 to the 20th Newtons and all points in the J hat direction. So now I have the force ME and the force MS F total on moon. When I write an F total, my practice is I write F and then subscript it with only the thing the force is acting on. So in this case, it's the force on the moon. So I'm just going to call that F sub M. And that's got to be F, uh, the force on the moon due to the sun, plus the force on the moon due to the earth. So now when I actually get that, I'm going to take and see that there's no uh, I component in the mass, uh, the force of FME, but there is one in the FMS. That force is, in fact, negative 4.3592 times 10 to the 20th Newtons. Excuse me, that's 10 to the 20th Newtons. I hat plus now I've got to take the Y component of FMS, which is 1.1151 times 10 to the 18th and that is actually a negative and I need to add that to this positive quantity in the y direction. So uh, I'll do a minus and I'll just change the sign. So this is 2.0032 times 10 to the 20th. That gives me positive 1.9920 times 10 to the 20th. Newton's J hat. So that's the entire force 
in IJK notation on the moon in this particular orientation. By the way, this particular orientation is sort of a third quarter moon. I'd actually have to know which way the Earth is orbiting to tell whether it's a third quarter or a first quarter moon, but that's basically what we're working out. So we've managed to get this force. Uh, it actually does mean something. We had a negative 1.11 times 10 to the negative, eight, or excuse me, from times 10 to the 18th. And that was subtracted from 2 times 10 to the 20th. So that's what gave us this Y component. So if I needed to, I could actually draw the vectors. They're both 10 to the 20th. So I can just pretend like it's just the mantissa. I'm going to say this is 4.3592. It's technically times 10 to the 20th Newtons. And then this other one is going to be about a little bit less than half the size. And actually, that one's going to be up. So I actually should probably make this a little further down. So uh, I'll put this force right here. And then I'll put this force right here. And this force is the 1.9920 times 10 to the 20th Newtons. And I do not need that. I'm going to move that, though. I'm putting it right there. So the actual resultant of this, we should be able to see by completing this rectangle slash parallelogram, the sum should be that vector. And I'm going to write it in blue. This is Fm. Of course, we also have our axes still. So I want to make sure everybody knows what that is. There's my x-axis. There's my y-axis, and I'm going to say I want this angle here, theta. So Fn, I don't need black anymore. Put it back in that. Now I'm going to go back to purple. So the magnitude of Fn, or excuse me, Fm, The magnitude of Fm is actually equal to the square root of 4.3592 squared plus 1.9920 squared times 10 to the 20th newtons. In other words, I can just do it that way because I want to. Uh, that gives me ultimately that Fm has a magnitude equal to 4.3592 squared plus 1.9920 squared. Take the square root of that. And that gives me 4.7928. Times 10 to the 20th Newtons. So there's our magnitude, and theta, the direction, is equal to the inverse tangent of opposite over adjacent. That'd be 1.9920 over 4.3592. Again, the 10 to the 20th would just cancel out anyway. So I'm going to take shift, tangent, inverse. I got to put parentheses on mine. So 1.9920 divided by 4.3592 in my parentheses equals 24.56 degrees is the actual answer. Okay. So what we can do is we can say F on the moon is equal to 
times 10 to the 20th. And that is at 180 minus that 24. That would be standard position. So this is at 155.44 degrees. But it also equals, of course, I can write it this way to save a little bit of space. It's going to be 4.36 times 10 to the 20th newtons in the negative plus on the positive 1.99 times 10 to the 20th newtons that way. So now we are done with this problem. Anybody have any questions on that? It, it's a slow process, but it is one that just automatically gives you the vectors, which is kind of nice. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to basically compute the forces, which is sort of what we did already, uh, and then make a triangle, ma namely using the line from the moon to the sun, make a triangle, find its X and Y components. Uh, of course, the hypotenuse is the length. That turns out to be the magnitude that the formula gives you. And then if you take that and multiply it by cosine of the angle below it, that would actually give you the X component. And if you multiply it by the sine of the angle below it, that would give you the Y component of the force. And uh, then you have to also add the Y component of the force from the moon. Uh, the, all of that, believe it or not, is a little bit, well, I think it's easier personally, but it's easy to get confused when you're doing that if you're not careful, whereas this one's pretty prescriptive. It's got exactly the formula that you need to get the vectors out and everything. So it's pretty good. Uh, anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so that's really just a mother of all problems. You can look back at the rest of these examples. For instance, in one and 241 uh, earlier, we did do a problem where I, te I checked how much uh, the centripetal force uh, necessary to keep a human in orbit, how much that affects our weight at the equator versus the North Pole. Uh, you can do that same thing now as well. And you can see that uh, one thing you could look at is that lowercase g is actually decreased by that. And your book solves that, that sort of problem as well. So I did say there's an extra credit you can do by calculating the differences. I, I will make that available. Uh, it is actually already available. But uh, anyways, if you need find if you need to find it, go ahead and look me up. Uh, send me a text or something. But this basically has it. I will tell you though. Let's quickly sh show you this. If we wanted to find a what I call a quick and dirty pseudo derivation of Kepler's three laws. What we'd say is Newton's second law says the summation of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. Uh, in this case, we're not dealing with any changing masses, so this F equals MA is fine. Later, we'll find out that it's something other than M times A that should be on the side. We're not going to worry about that. The summation of forces is only going to include one force. It's going to be F is equal to G M1, or excuse me, I'll say the mass of the sun, which I'll interpret as a big M. And then, well, actually, no, I'll, I'll do it with a little circle like they do in astronomy. So that's the mass of the sun times the mass of the planet divided by the radius of the orbit of the planet. Now, what we're going to do here is we're calling it a radius because we're going to assume that the orbit is actually circular. The orbits are not circular, but you'd be surprised how close they are to circular that this, this actually gives a fairly accurate result. So we're going to use that. And we're also going to use the fact that the velocity of something in orbit in a circular orbit has to be equal to 2 pi r over the period. And the acceleration necessary to keep something going in a circle is v squared over r. So I can combine all this and say the summation of the forces is just G M sun M planet over R squared. That's all equal to the thing that's doing the orbiting is the planet. So I'll put M planet. And then the A that we need is V squared over R. You can immediately see that this R cancels out with one of those. 
Now I can uh, also cancel out the mass of the planet. That's going to completely disappear. So uh, now I can plug in the actual formula for the velocity, and that gives me G times the mass of the sun over R is equal to 4 times pi squared times R squared over T squared. Because remember, the velocity on the right is still squared. So when I uh, put in 2 pi R over T, it becomes 2 squared pi squared R squared over T squared. The 2 squared is the 4. The pi squared is pi squared. The R squared is reasonable. Now, uh, excuse me. now that we have all that, we can go ahead and say that the square of the period is actually equal to 4 times pi squared over G times the mass of the sun, all of that times R cubed. And this is Kepler's third law. Now, if you actually used orbital mechanics, what I learned in like an or orbital mechanics class, uh, you would actually treat it as an ellipse. You'd still get the same answer, but in the place of R, there would be a semi-major axis, which your book is calling S. I normally call it A. But I also read, yeah. excuse me, in addition to the mass of the sun down there in the bottom, it would be the mass of the sun uh, in parentheses being added to the mass of the planet as well, also in parentheses. So that's pretty much the only difference. And now you know why that works out that way. Uh, if you have to actually examine something other than objects orbiting our sun, then uh, or let's start off with something orbiting our sun. If a planet, if a body, I should say, orbits our sun, then... I completely forgot what I was going to say with that. Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, if, the, if the body orbits our sun and we use years and astronomical units, AUs, then... Kepler's third law can be written P in years squared is equal to just your book is calling it S, so I'm going to go ahead and put S there. S cubed in astronomical units. Because we know, for instance, for instance, uh, we know T for the Earth in years is equal to one year. And R for the Earth, or excuse me, S for the Earth in AU is equal to 1 AU. So you can see if you stuck 1 on the left-hand side and squared it, you just get 1. And if you took the R and replaced it with one astronomical unit and cubed it, you'd still get one. So in order for that to be true, the 4 pi squared over GM must be equal to 1, at least if you put it in units of uh, years squared per, per AU cubed. So 4 pi squared over G times the mass of the sun should equal 1. And this is going to be year squared per astronomical unit Q 
skewed. So that's what we just figured out with that. That's a whole nother way of doing it. Now, uh, we were actually uh, talking about this. I will tell you there's something called the equivalence principle, and that basically was one of the first things that Einstein and other people saw when they were trying to repair gravity. What they discovered is you can't actually do an experiment that, at least on a small scale, that can uh, tell the difference between us being our head, for instance, being slammed backwards against our car seat uh, is that a result of uh, gravity pulling down on the back end of our car, or is that a result of us accelerating forward? If we had sort of a uh, a car like the va vampire on Buffy the Vampire Slayer drove with the blacked out windows and it was really loud and stuff, we couldn't necessarily tell whether we're speeding up, slowing down, and we couldn't see stuff. So we could literally have the car sitting vertically and the earth pulling down on us by gravitation or we could have us taking off with an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second per second, and we couldn't do an experiment to tell which one happened. For that reason, we were able to make uh, simple equations like you'll see in here, there's one example where a bullet fires through an elevator uh, that's actually going up, and then you tell how much the bullet uh, falls from one side of the elevator to the other and crossing the elevator. Uh, and that's another principle of uh, equivalence principle. But ultimately, Einstein was just able to figure out that gravity really is more of a depression in space that uh, makes things go in curved circles or in curved paths. So you can read on that. We're done with chapter six. If anybody has any questions, uh, I will be waiting around to the last person leaves, but you guys are free to go. Make sure you check, uh, you chatted me your first and last name already there. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Professor? Yes. Uh, did you get the uh, text message from my training officer? Yeah, I, I've been uh, composing it all day. I literally just sent it about three minutes before class started. Okay. So, yeah, I did get that. Thanks, Josh. Right. Of course. Thank you. Uh, Dylan, Mark, Miguel, anybody have any questions? Yeah, I, had a, I wanted to ask you... Uh, about a couple of questions that were on the test. Okay. Uh, hold on a second, uh, because I'm going to stop recording this for starters. Ah, smart. <laughs> okay. So let me stop recording it just because we're going to talk about uh, a test. And if anybody actually sees it, they might get the information about the test before they actually take it. Uh, Mark, are you still here? Yes, I am. Okay. Did you have a quick question or something kind of long? Oh, this is Mark from my 202 class? Yes. Okay. No problem either way then. Uh, I was worried about you being a student from the same class. So let me go ahead and answer his question. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, stop the recording at least.